afternoon. I'm Dr. Kyla McFarlane, Senior Academic Programs Curator in the Museums and Collections Department at the University of Melbourne. I'm convener of the CM Potter Museum of Art Interdisciplinary Online Forum on Consent, which is the fourth in an annual series co-presented by the Potter and the Centre of Visual Art at the University of Melbourne. I'm zooming in this afternoon from Rwandari land and thank you for joining us on Zoom from wherever you are. I'd now like to welcome Rose Hiscock to the session. Thanks, Rose. Thanks, Kyla. And hi, everyone, on this very warm, fabulous Melbourne afternoon. I have the pleasure of being the Director of Museums and Collections at the University of Melbourne. And it's such a pleasure to welcome you here to day one of the Ian Potter Museum of Arts Consent Interdisciplinary Forum. I'm joining you from uh, the University's Parkville campus. I'm on Wurundjeri land, and I pay my respects to Adi Dai Kerr, and elders past and present. And I also acknowledge the different lands that you might be joining us from uh, this afternoon. As you know, this is an ongoing series of forums developed and hosted by the Potter. It proposes art making as a form of knowledge creation alongside other academic fields of inquiry. Each forum, features, each forum features presentations and discussions from our academic colleagues from the University of Melbourne, leading voices in their respective disciplines, alongside contributions from creative practitioners, also leading voices in their discipline. Convened by Dr. Uh, Kyla McFarlane. And Kyla, thank you so much for your work on this. It's such a fabulous, it's a cracker of a program, I have to say. Um, this year's forum is developed in consultation with the University of Melbourne colleagues and collaborators, uh, Dr. Danny Butt, Associate Director of Research at the Victorian College of the Arts, Faculty of Fine Art and Music, Associate Director um, and Dr. Susie Fraser, Centre Coordinator at COVA, the Centre of Visual Arts. Um, founded in 2018, COVA was established to facilitate innovative and sustainable research and collaborative projects in the visual arts at the University of Melbourne. And it's fantastic to be co-presenting this forum. I think it shows the very best of that interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. I acknowledge and thank Jackie Doty, Head Curator of the Art Museums in co-convening the forum, and Annika Aitken, and as Carla said, you'll see Annika maybe pop up and down through the forum. Thank you. So each of our forums seeks to address pressing themes of our time from broad interdisciplinary perspectives. As you may know, our previous forums have covered broad topics, water, language, machine, and this year, consent. Is, is our theme and it's a concept so central to our lives. So what does consent look like in 2021? The past decade seen a seismic shift in society's understandings of consent across interpersonal, institutional, colonial and environmental contexts. The conversations around cons consent feel urgent. They certainly do as a woman, swirling and contested. And at its heart, questions of agency, respect, recognition, sovereignty, visibility, and empathy. It is the site where sy systemic change is enacted and where we negotiate power on an individual level. Against this backdrop, we ask, have learnings from the Me Too movement, decolonization, queer and body politics, and even COVID-19 had an impact on the ways we act, engage, communicate, Across the three next afternoons, we will unpick these themes. We'll be exploring consent from five key areas, COVID-19, decolonisation, data and the consumer, human and non-human relations, and bodily autonomy. It's a cracker of a program. Questions of consent affect us all as individuals and as a society in complex ways. And we begin our forum this afternoon with a keynote address from Professor Claire Delaney. Professor Delaney is a clinical ethicist at the Royal Children's Hospital, Children's Bioethics and the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne. She's also a professor in health Pro professions education in the Department of Medical Education, Melbourne Medical School. Claire teaches and conducts research in health ethics, health professions education, applied clinical ethics, critical thinking and clinical and ethical reasoning. Professor Delaney will take a philosophical approach to our theme, looking at what it means to respect, empower and promote a person's autonomy and autonomous choices. We're also pleased and honoured to have Professor Delaney as our session chair this afternoon. So following her keynote, we'll launch into a session on consent in the age of COVID-19, where we'll be looking at the complexities of consent in relation to our data, vaccinations and the pandemic city. 
Following our speakers' presentations, Professor Delaney will lead a discussion with our COVID-19 panelists, and we welcome you to contribute to this discussion with your own questions. So it is a great pleasure to hand over to Professor Delaney to start our forum today. Professor Delaney. Thank you, Rose. Thanks very much. And thanks for the opportunity um, to speak with you about the topic of consent. Okay, the idea of consent has many layers. Visible elements include information given by one person, followed by voluntary agreement given by another person who has capacity to understand the information and the choices available. Now, these are the obvious behaviours associated with consent. But beneath those formal and transactional elements of information exchange are much richer layers about the meaning of respect for another person's views and preferences. So today I'm going to have a go at unpacking those layers. And I'll draw from health a health practice context, describing examples of consent in this presentation, as that is the area that I've been involved in through research and clinical ethics work. And my focus will be on how consent occurs between a single health professional and a patient. I'm sidestepping our current COVID context in this talk, where ideas and expectations about the right to individual choice and informed consent have been and continue to be curtailed by a public health, ethical and legal framework, which emphasises public health safety or public safety and it gives greater ethical weight to population health rather than individual choice. But I'm really interested to hear from our speakers in this session who will delve much more deeply into aspects of consent and COVID. An iceberg provides a useful model to unpack the layers of meaning of consent. And I'll start with the above surface visible elements of the process of consent. And these comprise professional standards and legal obligations. The law has had a lot to say about how this information exchange should occur. Over time, it has developed a great emphasis on the need for a person to be given information in a way they can understand and then voluntarily agree with. But consent also has below surface foundations in ethical theory. From a moral point of view, consent is concerned with respecting giving effect to and promoting a person's autonomous decision-making. So these are the elements of consent. Um, there's a, an important precondition of competence. A person must be considered competent to understand information that is given to them, and then they must be free from coercive influences enabling them to give their informed consent. Based on my work in clinical ethics, these seemingly straightforward elements can become complicated. In many situations, the precondition of competence is hard to judge, or it may be variable in some people, or it may be contested. How much and what type of information to give is not always clear, and whether and how a person is being influenced by their history, environment, emotional state, and so on, is another challenging aspect of consent. So a quick example, a hypothetical case um, that I'm going to put up based on ethics consultations that I've been involved with, but not a real person. Sarah is 11 years old and is scheduled for heart surgery in two days' time. Her parents don't want her to know. They worry she'll be anxious. They've told her it's just another one of her regular brief stays in hospital and have asked nurses and other carers not to tell her. Sarah isn't an adult. She doesn't meet the precondition of competence to provide her informed consent, but she does have some capacity to understand and she will likely be adversely affected if she doesn't know and wakes up with lots of tubes in place and so, and so on, and arguably even more adversely affected than if she was told earlier. But Sarah's parents know her better than the clinicians and their autonomous decision is not to tell her as a way of protecting her. Whose values and autonomy matters in this case? Should Sarah be able to provide at least agreement to go ahead, if not full consent? 
Although the talk today won't explore the ethics of truth-telling in children and their right to give consent or assent, it will hopefully give you some insight into some of the legal, psychological and ethical aspects of consent. So I'm going to start with how the law guides the process of consent and via a case that, come, that came before the court in 1767. In this case, two doctors were hired by a patient to change the bandages on a partially healed fracture. But instead, the doctors elected to refracture the leg to improve alignment and place the leg in an unorthodox apparatus to achieve correction. In commenting on whether the doctors should have obtained consent for their decision to provide this unorthodox treatment for Mr Slater, the judge stated, it's reasonable that a patient should be told what is about to be done to him, that he may take courage and put himself in such a situation to enable him to undergo the operation. The need for patients to take courage was overtaken in the United States courts early in the 20th century by the rather more enlightened view that the patient might have some role in deciding whether or not to undertake the procedure for which courage was needed. The case here was described, the case was described as follows. The patient had consented to an examination of a lump under general anaesthetic, but didn't want to go on to surgery. And she was taken one night from the medical to the surgical ward and prepared for an operation by a nurse. On the following day, ether was administered and while she was unconscious, a tumour was removed. Her testimony is that this was done without her consent and knowledge. Following the operation and according to the testimony of her witnesses, because of this, gangrene developed in her left arm. Some of her fingers had to be amputated and her sufferings were intense. Benjamin Cardozo, a famous US judge, stated within the judgment of this case, the oft quoted phrase, every human being of adult years and sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with his body. In the well-known Australian case on consent, Rogers and Whittaker, Mrs Whittaker had been blind in one eye since she was nine years old. Her surgeon suggested that he could remove scar tissue in that eye and improve her sight. He decided she didn't need to know about a one in 14,000 risk of a complication involving inflammation of her good eye. That risk eventuated and Mrs Whittaker lost sight in her good eye and as a result became blind. Mrs Whittaker sued not on the basis that the surgery was negligently performed, but on the basis that if she'd been told about the risk of blindness to her good eye, she would never have gone ahead with the surgery. Dr Rogers claimed that the information provided accorded with information provided by other ophthalmologists and therefore was an appropriate uh, professional standard. Now, in judging whether the surgeon had failed in providing informed consent, the court found that in relation to the amount and type of information that a clinician should give to a patient, that standards of practice of health professionals are useful, but not the sole basis to judge professional behaviour. Instead, doctors owed a positive duty to provide information that's material to the patient before them. The Rogers and Whitaker case shifted the law from a reliance on the objective consideration of what other health professionals would normally say as a way to determine the standards of what information to give to a patient to an interest in whether that information is material and relevant to a particular person. Now, the judgment caused some consternation at the time within the medical profession. This included some resistance and, as shown here, the kitchen sink response. Doctors will be well advised to abandon malpractice cover, which will become prohibitively expensive, distribute their assets among their family or, and or insist on consent forms, which include the kitchen sink as well as every other known or suspected risk. It contributed to the development of a type of defensive medicine and the development of informed, many informed consent guidelines, which practitioners were obliged to follow. So has the law helped? It has contributed, um, uh, has the law, sorry, has the law helped in, in uh, us understanding the process of consent? 
So Jay Katz, a, a lawyer, I mean, a doctor and an ethicist in the US suggests no. Um, and in this article, he discusses how the court's single-minded emphasis on the need for health practitioners to disclose information about um, makes the objective of giving patients a greater voice in decision-making virtually unattainable and mythical. Stephen Kerridge from Sydney similarly states that where the law emphasises duties of disclosure, this may end up as a monologue between the doctor and the patient. On the positive side, Justice Michael Kirby, former High Court judge in Australia, suggests the law can have a powerful symbolic and galvanising role, and this is its major strength. The principle of informed consent is not just a legal rule devised by one profession to harass another. It's an ethical principle reflected in legal rules. And returning to Katz, the law has the potential to advance a more ethically enriched understanding of autonomy if it highlights the importance of having a conversation. So where have we got to so far in unpacking the layers of meaning of consent? The law has helped us understand what's required when obtaining a person's consent. And here I'll use another hypothetical example to illustrate that. Mr B is an 86-year-old, presents to the GP with a dark-coloured freckle on his forehead. A biopsy shows melanoma with lymph node involvement. Surgical excision is recommended involving major surgery, requiring a tracheostomy, breathing tube to, in his neck to bypass his mouth and nose breathing, and preventing him from speaking. And um, the bone around his eye and it will need to be reconstructed. So what would the surgeon have to say in order to meet legal requirements of consent? She would certainly have to outline the risks of the surgery, the nature of the procedure, the particular risks to Mr B and any other alternatives. And if the surgeon provides this information, her communication would be complying with the law. And yet there seems to be more at stake for Mr B than knowing the options and the risk. To honour the ethical ideas underpinning consent, more seems to be needed. So here is where I think it's useful to go below the surface. Giving a person an opportunity to give their voluntary and considered consent to something is a moral ideal related to respect for each person's autonomy, their dignity as a human, and their self-determination. The limitations of the law and professional guidelines are that they specify this moral ideal into a moral rule. And that considerably narrows the scope of behaviour. And in the case of consent, it narrows it into a focus on disclosure behaviours. So in the next part of this talk, I'll draw from some key ethical ideas about the meaning of respect for another person's autonomy and highlight how these ideas can directly inform consent that occurs in the real world above the surface. I'll first refer, refer to Gerald Dworkin, a philosopher who helpfully unpacks what autonomy and autonomous choice means. He describes autonomy as a capacity that we all have a responsibility to exercise that grounds our notion of having a character. And he defines it in this following way. Autonomy is a second order capacity to reflect critically upon one's first order preferences and desires and an ability either to identify with these or to change them in the light of higher order preferences and values and reasoning. So a simple example is you find yourself walking past a well-known gelato shop at 6 p.m. on your way home to cook dinner and you're hungry. Your first order preferences might be to go in and buy a chocolate gelato, but your second and higher order preferences, which enable you to reflect on your initial preferences and desires, mean you think again about how, you, how it will affect your appetite for dinner and your longer-term goals to lose a few kilos after COVID lockdowns. In the Mr B example, the first reaction might be, yes, please go ahead with the surgery if it has a chance of removing this melanoma. But perhaps after reflecting and thinking about the risks 
and the quality of life he will have after such major surgery and at his age, he may think again, or he may still go ahead. According to Dworkin, by exercising such a capacity of thinking and reflecting about our values and preferences in the long and short term, and in relation to what gives our life some meaning, we give coherence to our lives and take responsibility for the kind of person we are. The philosophical understanding of what autonomy and autonomous choice involves has, also, has practical application to the process of consent. It means that Mr B's surgeon, for example, needs to inquire into or even assist Mr B to consider what matters to him and how he would like to live his life with this diagnosis. It requires more than the High Court required in the Rogers and Whitaker case, where they stipulated the importance of tailoring information to the needs of the patient. The more that Dworkin asks for is that a clinician should ask about what their patient's values and hopes for in the short, in the longer term are, and how the proposed surgery and possible outcomes will affect those values and hopes. Jay Katz provides another useful conception of autonomy, which further enriches the idea of how consent might be implemented beyond compliance with rules. Katz suggests that for a long time, there's been a tradition of silence between doctors and patients, where a doctor silently or implicitly works to benefit a patient using her skills and knowledge, and the patient willingly and silently plays their role and trusts in the expertise of the doctor. Now, this idea sounds somewhat outdated now and a little more attuned perhaps to the experiences of Mr Slater in 1767. Katz suggests that it's important to distinguish on the one hand between a person's right to self-determination, which might be given effect to by giving them information in a transactional way and obtaining their consent, and on the other hand, their capacity to exercise that right to self-determination. So in the case of Mr B, he has a right to know information about available treatment, but his capacity to take in the information may be affected by the shock of hearing this diagnosis. He may not be able to comprehend the extent of the surgery and the effect it will have on him. So Katz points to the importance of considering both internal and external aspects of self-determination. That is, Mr B's capacity, his internal capacity, including cognitive, psychological and emotional um, sort of capabilities to think about his own first and second order preferences, but also being aware of the external influences on Mr B, including the clinical environment, the shock that such information brings, and the time and support needed to process such information. And Katz frames these ideas as a conversational model of consent. And this is both simple and profound. It requires genuine interest in a person's views and understanding. It requires inquiring about what a person is thinking about, how they are feeling, and what they need to help them think further. These types of inquiries were certainly missing for Mr Slater in 1767, and they were missing for Mrs Whitaker, who claimed in the evidence that she was terrified of losing sight in her good eye and that Dr Rogers hadn't actually asked her about that. And they may have been missing for 12-year-old Sarah, who likely had her own views but was also dependent on the decisions her parents were making for her. And these types of inquiries often remain missing in circumstances where consent is obtained according to current legal requirements. So how might the below surface layers of ethics theory inform and shape the visible and compliance-based process of consent? I suggest that knowing more about what it means to exercise autonomous choice and what it means to respect and promote this capacity in another person 
requires particular dispositions of openness and curiosity. It requires um, a, a curious, a, a, well, a starting feature of a consent conversation, which is enriched by ethical understanding, is acknowledgement that one, there is no single best way to live a flourishing life. So finding out what another person's views and ideals are is a basic part of the consent conversation. A second feature is an awareness of your own motivations, interests and expectations. And as a health professional, being able to share them. For example, the surgeon treating Mr B may state how they have the right skills to be able to perform their required surgery and this is what they do best. But that they are also aware that Mr B might want to know about other options or have concerns or questions about the surgery or that they might need a bit more time and support to consider this major treatment and how it might affect their life and the way they see themselves living. And a third feature is being willing and open to exploring both reasonable and what you might find and regard as non-reasonable decisions, values and judgments that a competent person autonomously chooses to make. So that's my introduction to a few layers of consent. And in the next um, speakers, I think you, and, and over the next few days, I'm hoping that these will have some resonance um, in the, in where people hone in on specific areas where consent is, is a particular issue. So thank you for listening to this opening presentation. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Um, and I think we're moving straight into the next speakers. Is that correct, right. Marla? Yes, thanks so much, Claire, for that great keynote. Um, and it's probably good for me to mention that um, people probably have questions for you, Claire, but we are very happy to receive those in the Q&A and um, address them in our discussion yeah. after the, the COVID session. Yeah. But, yeah, I'd be really keen to continue the conversation. Um, and I'm also aware that I, um, in, in focusing in on the health professional, I'm hoping people can make links to other, other um, professional endeavours where I think the same ideas are relevant.